And uh, now I would ask our last uh, panelist, Mr. Tomasz Wetzel, a scholar, who PhD in law, uh, who uh, became a practitioner and talks on uh, the Hungarian reunification. Would you prefer to come here or? Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear guests, uh, I'm the last one from this W group. Uh, I feel I'm, I'm not in a good position, in a go good situation, because uh, State Secretary uh, Arpad Potapi uh, elaborated uh, in great detail what I wanted to uh, say, and then Mira uh, 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 Walter uh, Bory uh, showed us everything what we uh, what we know about uh, Hungarian diaspora policy, but uh, uh, I must work for the lunch. So let me uh, uh, let me review some thoughts which were mentioned. Uh, first of all, I appreciate the kind uh, invitation of the two institutes uh, for this conference. I hope uh, and I'm of the opinion that this event will be very useful for all of us. I think uh, we row in the same boat. Uh, we have comparable problems, uh, almost similar problems. We can understand one another. I think we can share our answers, our best practices, and I'm really curious about uh, the outcome of our uh, discussions. Just some words about the Hungarian uh, diaspora. Uh, this is a much layered uh, diaspora as a result of various waves of emigration from Hungary from the late 19th century. The majority, uh, for instance, in the United States do not speak Hungarian, uh, but they know the origin of, uh, of uh, Hungary. Differences in mentality and each individual's uh, connection to Hungary are uh, relevant and uh, sometimes could uh, cause uh, conflicts within the, the co uh, communities. Some old communities are aging and next to them exist thousands of young Hungarians, Hungarian workers whose links to Hungary are rather different. Uh, one thing is uh, true for all our Hungarian communities abroad. They were able to integrate into their new uh, country very well. And the Hungarian diaspora is ex especially appreciated in these societies. Uh, in the neighboring countries, we have uh, other questions. Uh, their communities live in uh, their birthplace and are firmly connected uh, to the keen state and their country as well. In every country, the situation is different. Just think of Slovenia with outstanding minority rights and what is happening now in Ukraine and with the 150,000 uh, Hungarians who are living there. So we come to the title, the Hungarian re reunification. Uh, this refers to a constitutional unification, a unification in citizenship uh, law and rights. Uh, unification without changing borders, but stepping beyond the tragedies of the 20th century. So we are talking about the unification of souls and rights. Uh, I think this is the most important part of this reunification, unification of souls and rights. Some parts of this reunifications are symbolic, other appear in political and of course in material issues. In 2010, our new government launched an unprecedented policy by amending the citizenship law and establishing uh, the so-called simplified naturalization procedure. Every person who has uh, Hungarian ancestry, and this is uh, very important, ancestors who held Hungarian uh, citizenship, and some knowledge of Hungarian language can apply for Hungarian citizenship. Our law recognizes dual citizenship and is based on the Bus Sanguinis principle. So even the third and fourth and fifth generation of the diaspora um, inherit uh, Hungarian citizenship. In the last 12 years, most of the administrative burden was dropped uh, in our law and practice. So more than 1.1 million people were able to get or get back Hungarian citizenship. So 1.1 million people. I think this is one of the most important uh, steps in our uh, policy and uh, in our, uh, our administrative sector. Uh, 
mostly from uh, they are mostly from Romania, Serbia, and Ukraine. But applications were submitted in more than 70 countries. This is a great success for the Keen State and for every community as well, as uh, well as usually being a cathartic experience for the new citizens. Uh, we have had applications from more than 100 year old people who had unintentionally lost Hungarian citizenship twice. I remember an old man, a 104 year old man from New York, uh, who was one of the first who applied for Hungarian citizenship in 2011. He was born in, uh, in Austro Hungarian monarchy. Uh, and uh, in that region, uh, uh, Subcarpathian uh, region, which is uh, now uh, uh, in Ukraine. And he was born as a Hungarian citizen. Then after the First World War, he lost Hungarian citizenship and became Czechoslovak citizen. Uh, in 1938, he got back uh, his Hungarian citizenship. After the Second World War, he, uh, he became Soviet citizen. Zakarpatska Oblast, and then he somehow managed to uh, abandon the Soviet Union and uh, became an uh, American citizen and became a very successful man. And after 104 years, he became a Hungarian citizen a uh, third time. I, th uh, I think uh, this is a story from the tragedies of the, of the 20th centuries. Uh, as you know, and you heard, the uh, parliamentary election is to be held in Hungary on Sunday. As uh, so of uh, 2014, every Hungarian living abroad can vote. They can vote for lists, and their votes can affect two or three, perhaps three seats in our parliament, which means about 1% of the seats. I think this is, this is also very important, uh, not just symbolic, but partly symbolic uh, step. What I consider very important is that our amendment of citizenship law, election law, supporting and development policy does not seem new or specific. These laws, rights, and, uh, uh, and practices uh, have traditions in different countries, and our law also meets the requirements of both international law and EU law. In the last uh, 12 years, uh, progress has been undisputed, I think, and this reunification in Soros has been strengthened throughout the Hungarian nation. Several good programs could be mentioned, uh, uh, but I just have, uh, drew, want to draw attention to three aspects uh, in this short time. First, uh, be advanced in terms of development policies. In, uh, especially in, Hung in Serbia and in, uh, in Ukraine. Hungary supported Ukraine, including both Hungarian and Ukrainian communities, with more than 200 million euros in the last uh, 10 years before the war. So I think this is also very important. The importance of medical, educational, and economic aid is, uh, is and was invaluable. Uh, second, uh, connections with the Jewish communities, Hungarian Jewish communities became much better and several great strides were made to build coin, uh, confidence. And third, relationships uh, between Hungarian communities and the Kin state are uh, mostly unproblematic uh, and these communities attempt to support one another, for example, in this wartime times. I'm of the opinion that we can see three strategies and uh, policies for Hungarians abroad. Uh, I agree with uh, Mira that one for communities in the neighboring countries, one for the old diaspora, and another one for the recently relocated Hungarians, for the new diaspora, as we say. However, I look forward to additional steps being made in uh, further areas. So first, there is further potential in the Hungarian diaspora, not just in traditional and cultural respects, but also in terms of economic, scientific, and uh, lobby potential. Uh, second, our government has established uh, promising initiatives for third and fourth generations seeking their uh, roots. And there are further steps forward being made in this area. And uh, homecoming uh, must be encouraged and the administrative burden uh, should be minimized. 
the, our government should help those who want to return to Hungary with the assistance of a so-called welcome office, uh, like in Croatia, I think there is a uh, similar uh, institutions. So finally, I would like to wish you a fruitful conference and a delicious, delicious, delicious lunch. Thank you very much. Tomasz, thank you very much. And uh, I really think what you observed uh, mm, mm, at all the <clears throat> participants' family me starts with a W, I think. This happens first time in the history of Hungary having all the panelists. <laughs> so, uh, but before lunch, we have still a bit time and I guess you have questions. So I would like to ask you whether you have questions. If yes, put, your, put the questions to our distinguished presenters. Yes? I've got a question. First of all, in uh, the for the Lawrence, uh, uh, do I have an answer? All, but maybe for the other, other uh, speakers too. Uh, policy means uh, governmental organization, uh, first of all. But uh, my question is what is the, the role of uh, the Israeli NGOs in that? All country diaspora relations, because uh, diaspora usually is uh, some sort of global NGO. <clears throat> and uh, what are the relations between Israel NGO and uh, global Jewish and uh, diaspora NGO? So, is it, is it uh, regulated somehow? Yeah. And maybe the it, same. It, the first of all, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question, and I apologize that because of the parameters of. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, our presentation today, I couldn't go into that in more detail. So yes, there are several uh, institutions, you can call them even quasi-state institutions, one in particular, which has as its mission um, the promotion, and what I like, you spoke of cross-pollination, um, and it's, that's what its mission is, to develop these relations between um, Jews living outside of Israel and the, I think you call this properly in the jargon of this business, the kin state. So yes, there are also other institutions which are not quasi-state institutions, but which benefit from the government's largesse to advance this agenda because the government believes that the work that they are doing is so vital that they should benefit from government subsidies. So, for example, I mentioned uh, something that's called birch, birthright, in Hebrew called taglit, which has brought the 750,000 young people to Israel. That initially began as a private initiative. There were several very wealthy people, philanthropists, who established that. But over time, very quickly, the Israeli government came to the conclusion that this is a very important um, agenda and that it is producing positive results. And so it began, to, it began to subsidize that as well, not covering the whole budget by any means, but contributing very generously. And when it began to do that, there was also some skepticism publicly. Should government, should the taxpayer's money be used to enable young people, many of whom are not necessarily in economic need, to pay for them to come to Israel? Cannot they, can their parents pay? And very quickly, people came to the conclusion that this is money very well spent because it was, in fact, creating a very positive ambiance. And beyond the ambiance, the people who are, we can call them graduates of this program, when they went back to their countries of origin, became very good. I don't know whether we should speak of them as ambassadors or advocates for Israel and maintain very good relations and continue to do so. In terms of NGOs on the other side, so that's to say, uh, let's say institutions that are operating in the diaspora countries. Um, in many instances, of course, the Israeli government recognizes that they are doing very valuable work and there are very close ties which uh, find expression in many common programs. They are bringing delegations and the government, of course, is always willing to meet those delegations uh, on specific uh, initiatives. Sometimes the government is also stepping in with financial subsidies. So by all means, your question is very well taken and it's, um, it's, it's I think, been established long ago that 
there has to be there has to be a government role in promoting this if the government really does believe that it's to its benefit and clearly it does. And I don't know if you just have so much of anything to add, but I would just sort of follow up on the perspective that I think it's again in one of these difficult balances is in terms of uh, state policy is when to support sort of projects um, within the diaspora or in neighboring countries um, to help you know build projects to, to have some long term support for projects versus oh Sorry, never accused of needing microphones before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I usually teach in classrooms with 125 students, so I'm, I'm good at projecting when I need to, but thank you. Um, uh, versus this idea of, of policies from the state sort of, um, I mean, cr almost supplanting or, or creating things out of whole cloth that don't exist on the ground. And, and in the circumstances in which it seems that the state needs to actually create these institutions, perhaps um, what we, you know, we heard about uh, in the case of, of uh, Hungarian parts of Ukraine. I mean, maybe that was necessary because of the, the lack of Ukrainian state presence in those areas and those institutions existing, but it seems that the long-term goal of that should be to create local institutions that are self-sustaining, right, in which they can get support from the neighboring country, or if they're in a more far-off diaspora, they can get support when needed from the mother country, but that they are not um, continuously reliant on that, right? So kind of, um, so I think that's a, this, you know, something to, to be worked with. That's a really important, that kind of civil society NGO aspect is very important. I could, could I just add one thing that uh, perhaps I have, I, I don't think I need it, you can all hear me without that. <laughs> in my own household, everybody complains that uh, the, the neighbors across the street can hear me speaking. <laughs> Um, I don't hear well, and perhaps that's the reason. Um, I, I have perhaps been um, derelict in making my presentation in explaining also that we have also a dedicated ministry devoted to the idea of diaspora relations. It's not a very big ministry. It doesn't have a huge budget. It doesn't have immense power. Um, but we do have, it, in other words, the importance of this uh, uh, issue is well recognized so much to the extent that we actually have a ministry. Now always, and I know in many other countries, there's always some jockeying who has responsibility for certain uh, tasks. And so sometimes the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, well, well this, is really our, this is really our business. But the fact that there is a recognition that there needs, to be, there needs to be a central address to coordinate these efforts is also important because not every country obviously recognizes the need for such an institution. Thank you very much. And I see it's a Sakharash and then. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I'm Rosh Sakharash with the American Human Rights Foundation. Um, most of your presentations were about policies of uh, Hungary and uh, diaspora, for diaspora communities. But in your work, do you find any information on what is the benefit for the mother country in terms of financial uh, transfers? Uh, your institute had organized a, a conference some time ago in which the Irish ambassador said that they spent about 400 million euros a year for the Irish community and they received about 6 billion euros a year. Is there such a calculation or information in your research? I think uh, uh, the Hungarian uh, policy making, Hungarian diaspora policy making, uh, came from uh, uh, mostly from uh, cultural aspects. So uh, I I know what uh, what you are saying. So when I was in Dublin, I uh, I couldn't ima Im uh, imagine that uh, the Irish uh, policy, Irish diaspora policy, is mostly from financial uh, methods or for, uh, from financial point of view. Uh, this this was uh, not completely. Uh, uh, out of our um, scope, but uh, uh, but we uh, we never uh, we never uh, uh, counted uh, how much uh, we spent for uh, for the Canadian uh, uh, Hungarian community, which is one of the one of the largest and the richest uh, community in the world uh, and one of the richest country in the world. Uh, we support them, so like uh, like the other co uh, community in uh, Serbia or in Ukraine. So I, uh, 
I, uh, I agree that uh, 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 there's a great potential uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this economical uh, point of view, and uh, we should, uh, we should uh, uh, take more effort uh, in, this, in this scene. I, I could just add something to what has been said. Uh, at least in the Israeli context, I'm afraid I cannot speak of research uh, along those lines, which doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I'm sure there is some uh, research into it, but I think the general feeling is that whatever is, and we can call it quite honestly, whatever is invested in this may bear fruits that will not be seen immediately. So in other words, if you are cultivating a certain community overseas, and the idea is that by doing so, those people will retain their ties to the mother country, this will find expression it may be spiritual, or it may be in the creative realm, but it will also find uh, expression even in, the, even in what you might call dollars and cents terms, even if it may take some time to do that. I can give you just one example. In the case of Israel, um, our country benefits very greatly from the generosity, the largesse of Jewish people living in different parts of the world. There is the expectation that people who have reached a certain level of financial success will generously contribute to institutions in Israel. Of course, they never give quite as generously as we would like them to, <laughs> but we have many institutions. And if you travel in Israel, you will see many institutions that bear the name of foreign donors. We are quite clearly that if you can continue to maintain that spirit that people have responsibility uh, for the welfare of people in Israel, it will, it will continue in successive generations. Another matter, and one that we speak about entirely, is does Israel have a responsibility to give generously to them when they are in need? And the answer is yes, because Israel has also reached a certain level of economic success. We are not any longer a country that's really very dependent on, on the aid of Jews in other countries, where once upon a time we were, because we were living in very difficult times, um, I can say quite honestly, times of great austerity, particularly when we were absorbing large numbers of immigrants, there were no workplaces, there weren't the places to house them, but today it's a, it's, Israel is a, is a very prosperous country. So this is always a two-way street. It's not only a question of what will the, the mother state gain from investing, but what will those communities gain as well? Thank you. Yeah, I, just uh, two quick points. And first of all, I mean, I think it's a, an interesting question. We It'd be a little weird to have a two-day conference about remittances, I mean, about diasporas, without um, recognizing the fact that remittances, money sent back home from people who leave their country and work el elsewhere, is literally the second largest uh, form of international money transfer in the world, right? I mean, it's second yes. only to um, sort of, uh, you know, international, so FDI, right, foreign direct investment, and then you have remittances, and third is international aid, right? And for many countries, this is a driving factor for having a diaspora policy in that you keep the first, gener first and second generation, in particular, the ones who are more likely to have a relationship with the country they came from, you keep them feeling connected in part, I don't think you can as you said, you can't reduce this to an economic logic, but in part you do this in order to keep those remittances coming, right? For states that are highly dependent on them, right? For example, like the Mexican state completely changed its attitude towards Mexicans in the United States, um, in part because of a recognition that if they didn't, they would be, be losing out on that money. Not that that was the only reason. So um, I think there has been some data on remittances back to Hungary. I know it's not a very large part of Hungary's GDP, but certainly having yes. people you know, working in, in different parts of, of Western Europe and sending some money home, there has been some remittance flow. Um, Again, in the, in the broader scheme of things, it might be another you know, reason to have a, a more substantial policy on that sort of newer immigrant population, right? Um, on, the, on the economic development in the, uh, in the region, again, a sort of maybe a long-term economic goal could be seen as creating a larger regional economic, Hungarian economic sphere in which potentially down the road that could yield economic benefits, um, you know, for for Hungary. Um, 
to the extent that that is, is sort of a strategic long-term goal, I am not the one uh, to say, but it seems like there's the, the possibility for that. And I think it would be quite unusual, and I'm not sure <coughs> we can say what the, the longer-term impacts of that would be. But you know, I think that's, that's something, it's a relatively new set of policies. As, as Thomas said, there's a lot of money being spent. Um, something to watch. So. Sir, I could add one thing also that we haven't discussed, at least this is relevant to the Israeli context, and perhaps it's relevant to other uh, countries that are, have such policies. Um, in Israel, um, for many years, uh, there's, people are encouraged, for example, people who are not living in Israel but are outside the country, to buy properties in Israel. So they have a second home, because the idea is that if you have a flat in Israel, it will also uh, burnish your contact with another country, you will be coming more often, you're likely to send your children. That's also had an impact on the price of real estate in Israel, uh, about which some people have complained, saying it's very nice that uh, well-to-do well -to -do people living overseas are buying flats in Jerusalem, but this has uh, exerted an upward pressure on the price of properties, and therefore the people who are living in the country uh, find it more difficult to, to, to buy homes because the, the, the people living outside the community who are often outside the country, pardon me, often well-to-do, are able to plunk down a lot of money. So that's a whole other whole uh, thing to be explored. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Also, I could see McCarthy. Yeah, there is one question to Thomas. And, uh, just a, a quick question. Uh, the election next week, uh, this week, uh, this week. Sunday, yeah. um, and, and you mentioned that three uh, MPs are directly uh, elected by diaspora, or it is, uh, is the consequence of their world to have come from you know, overseas? Is, that, that, so, is there any special, you know, I mean, diaspora representation system that is designated for diaspora, or? No. Okay. No, 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 not, not like in Italy for, uh, for uh, MPs, uh, for uh, South, South American Italians. This is a big hat, uh, I, I can say, with uh, 90, 93 uh, MPs uh, who are from the, from the what is called the uh, uh, country list uh, and other 106 uh, from the individual uh, districts uh, are voted in Hungary. So the the votes from uh, from uh, living uh, from living abroad are are mangled in the in this uh, big hat. Thank you. 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 Thank you.